I get to uh, introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, and I'm going to try to keep this so it is not a diss, Manuel. I'm trying to keep this really short so you have the longest amount of time to speak. Um, but I want to make sure that you all know who Manuel is. Um, so Dr. Manuel Perez Quinones is going to be uh, speaking to us today on the importance of identity and the, sex, the success of students from minoritized communities. Um, Dr. Perez Quinones, um, we are really lucky at UNC Charlotte to have him. He is a professor of software and information systems in the College of Computing and Informatics, where he came to us from Virginia Tech. Um, and although um, he is a faculty member on our campus, he is on leave this semester working as the visiting professor um, at, I'm going to, I don't know how to say this, Curie College of Computing Sciences at Northeastern uh, University where he's uh, running the Center for Inclusive Computing and providing his expertise for that center. He has a lot of experience as an administrator. He was an Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at Virginia Tech and an Associate Dean in the College of Computing and Informatics on our campus. And most recently has been working as a fellow in the Graduate School at, U at UNC Charlotte and amongst his other duties there, he's been doing a lot of work um, on diversity, equity, inclusion um, for the graduate programs. And before I turn over the virtual podium to him, I wanna tell you just really briefly about his most recent awards because I think they provide even more insight into why we asked him to speak to you today. Um, he was awarded the ACM Distinguished Member for Outstanding Educational Contributions to Computing um, and the Computing Research Association's A. Nico Haberman Award which is an award to a person who has made outstanding contributions aimed at increasing the numbers and or successes of underrepresented members in the computing research community. And he also received the Richard A. Tapia Achievement Award for Scientific Scholarship, Civic Science and Diversifying Computing. So I welcome um, Dr. Pérez Quinones uh, and I turn over the virtual podium to you. Uh, thank you. Wow, that's a short version. I want to hear the long one. Um, let's see. I'm going to try to share my screen and make sure you see my slides. You see my slides? Yes. Okay. So um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I thought it was great that you pronounced my name in Spanish. So I was happy after Manuel, you know, rather than Manuel or whatever. Um, I want to talk about the importance of identity. Um, and I want to I wanted to start with a little exercise. I think that exercise is ruined now because Yvette sort of gave all my secrets. Uh, but but I, I'm, let's try it anyway. Uh, and you don't have to say anything. You don't have to post in the chat. I don't want to call anybody out. But I want you to think what, what comes to mind when I tell you I'm a Hispanic computer science professor. I, I'll give you a couple of seconds to sort of let a couple of ideas bubble up to the top. And I want you to hold on to them because I want to sort of talk about the issue of identity when it relates to that. Should have played some Jeopardy music. So, so uh, what, what comes to mind? So there are a couple of things that should trigger things, right? Hispanic. I, I'm a Hispanic. so. You're probably thinking, is he an immigrant? Did he grow up in this country? Did, was he, um, did he come from another country? I think I'm hearing some echo from others. I don't know. Um, so Hispanic should evoke some images, ideas, thoughts about who I am. The other one is computer science professor. You don't see many Hispanic computer science professor. And I don't know what, what that prompts in your head. You know, you're probably thinking that he's an instructor or, or he, he teaches his only freshman courses or something like that. So uh, a lot of these ideas are at the notion of this idea of your perception of others. Um, and in particularly the idea of perceptions as a deficit or an asset, right? Uh, some of you, and probably this group, this would not be an issue, but normally in a, in a presentation where the community wasn't as diverse as it is here, this would be an issue. And a lot of ideas might be things that I don't have, right? Uh, you know, I say I'm Hispanic, you say, oh, English is a second language. If I say I grew up in Puerto Rico, 
You say, oh, you know, yeah, they only speak Spanish down there. And that's a deficit mentality. You're thinking of things that I don't have without necessarily knowing that or not. Um, some of you might have thought, wow, his English is pretty good for a Hispanic. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm breaking expectations. I don't know. Um, but some of you might actually think what I think is the right thing to think, which is really hard to do because a lot of these things are unconsciously coming to your head. Um, I, wow, he, I wonder if he speaks more than one language. I don't necessarily speak more than one language just because I'm Hispanic. I do, but, but, but I hadn't told you that. Um, but some of you might be thinking, you know, I wish I would have kept up with Spanish from high school. I wanted to be bilingual by now in my life. That's the thinking of thinking of something that I might have as an asset. And that sort of gets at the heart of this issue of perception of my identity, right? Are you thinking of things that I don't have because I'm a minority? Or are you thinking of things that you assume that I might have? And that might be kind of cool, you know? It's like, well, I, I need to talk to him to see how we can get there. Um, all the things that you might have thought, is he a US citizen? Is he a first generation? Uh, he teaches computer science. That Hopefully you think that's an asset because my field is in very high demand right now. And that has all kinds of kind of cool things that come with it. It also means I have lots of students in my classes, which is not necessarily easy to deal with. Um, so, so let me sort of break some of those. And Yvette mentioned almost all of these. So I'm, I'm going to break the, the, the bubble and all these. I'm a tenured full professor in computer science. Um, and, and my background is human computer interaction and CS education done a ton of work in diversity in academia and as part of professional organizations in computing. Um, I worked at multiple institutions. I, I worked at the Naval Research Lab for six years doing research at a government laboratory. I worked four years at the University of Puerto Rico. I spent 15 years at Virginia Tech and I'm on my seventh year at UNCC. I was visiting professor at the Naval Academy one semester, which was sort of an experience that is really interesting kind of cool to you walk in a classroom and all the students stand to attention and stand until you tell them you may be seated. Uh, that's never happened in any other semester or any other institution. Um, and I'm a visiting professor at Northeastern right now this semester working with the Center of Inclusive Computing. Give a TEDx talk that's getting a lot of people sort of interested. Um, and it also was picked up and featured in a podcast uh, it was edited down to five uh, minutes and, and it's available as a TEDx short podcast. I'm a member of the Committee of the Status of Women in Science and Engineering and Medicine at the National Academies. As part of that, I was co-author of a report that just came out on the trajectory of women of color in tech and uh, the professional distinctions that Yvette mentioned. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of these burst bubbles when you heard my name and the fact that I'm a computer science professor. Um, um, I'll burst one more bubble in case you don't know this. I'm not a first generation college student, far from it. My father is a lawyer. My mom was a college professor, department head multiple times. My mom's mom, my grandma was a nurse and she wanted to be a doctor, but she was not allowed to go to medical school at the time. Um, my mom's uh, aunt, my grandpa's, my grandpa's sister was a dean, the first female dean at the University of Puerto Rico. She was dean of the business college. Uh, my mom's sister, my aunt, was a college professor. My dad's brother was a dentist. Uh, my wife has a PhD from Georgetown as a professor here. Uh, her siblings, one of them is a vet uh, and vice president of animal collections at the St. Louis Zoo. My other brother-in-law has a bachelor's degree from Wharton School of Business from UPenn. I mean, you know, we academia is the life of my whole family so so and so i don't know that you normally see a phd full professor in computer science that has that long big background of family history in academia but that's who i am and that's not an identity that you would have applied to me and and that sort of brings us into the issue of why identity matters and in particularly sort of uh the the clash between the perceived identity and the conception, the self-conception of identity, right? The perceived identity is sort of how you see me as part of another group. It's what do you think about me? What do you think of my group? In this previous little exercise, you probably applied some stereotypes to me because of my ethnicity or my professional discipline. Um, 
And some of the challenges that come with the perceived identity is stereotypes, is biases, is microaggressions. Um, and, and I think all of you know those terms. The self-conception of identity is the other side. It's, it's my view of myself. It's how I identify myself. What kind of group do I belong to? I'm a Latino, I'm a Hispanic, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm from the Caribbean. And I'm all of those at the same time. I'm in no particular order. You can't take one off any more than the others. I, I'm, that's part of my identity. Um, and this self-conception is what drives me to affiliate with other groups. It's what makes me consider myself as part of that group. And I've only mentioned sort of the, the ethnic and race background in here, but part of my identity is that I'm a computer science professional, professor, a researcher. And that, that's, again, you can't peel that off. I, you know, I, I might not be working as a professor in a particular point. I still have a PhD in computer science and that's just part of who I am. And the issue with identity is the clash between the perceived and the self-conception. That is where the problems become when we're dealing with supporting students, is that we look at them and we apply to them uh, a group identity and some perceived identity attributes, and they think of themselves maybe differently. And that clash is at the heart. It's one of the challenges for inclusion. It's one of the things that makes inclusion difficult because we want them to be part of the group that they might not want to be part of that particular group. They might want to be part of a different group. So briefly, let me talk about perceived identity. Microaggressions, um, and again, I think this group probably understands all these things, are very common. There are situations that basically are telling you, you're not like me and you don't belong here. Not necessarily implicit, not necessarily on purpose, uh, things like, uh, and these are some of the ones that I get a lot. Your name is so cute or so long or so interesting or so unique. And, and it's that little thing that you put over the end. And it's like, it, it, that's just normal part of my name. Don't make it look weird because you're highlighting the fact that I, my name doesn't look like your, or, or people that tell you, I love how you make that RR sound. It's like, what? Or, or another one that it's intended to push you away. I'm a third generation American. Uh, you know what? I'm a third generation American too. Um, because Puerto Ricans became citizen in 1917. Um, my grandma was alive. So that means my dad was born a US citizen, which means I'm a US citizen by birth. So that's three generations. So, and I don't know what that means. Does that mean that it, that's better than a two generation American? Nowhere, anywhere that is defined as Americanness. So so these are phrases that are used as a way to try to separate us, to try to define identity in ways that say, I'm, I'm not like you or you're not like me and you don't belong here. The other side is, is the implicit uh, bias. And so these social stereotypes that people apply to a group um, without thinking about it. It just comes implicitly and, and it li literally almost always leads to flawed decision-making, right? Um, people assume because Spanish was my first language that maybe uh, English is not my forte when I write. But honestly, I've been written English more in my life than Spanish. I wrote in Spanish when I was in high school and that was it. So, so writing in Spanish is, is, you know, even communicating in general in Spanish is not a strength for me. Even though speaking Spanish it probably comes more natural than English right now. Um, and that that's, you make those assumptions. I've had people that tell me, well, it's too bad you don't like to write. And go like, who, who the hell told you that? I mean, I, you know, wh where do you get that? And that sort of leads to blocking opportunities or blocking sponsorship opportunities or people thinking, well, let's not put Manuel because he's not an English speaker. He cannot do this type of job. Um, and then there's this stereotype threat, which is unfortunately the way our brain works is that we live up to the stereotypes that they apply to our groups. So we somehow don't sort of go out of our way of saying, I can do that job because it's like, no, people like me are not supposed to do that job. So I'm not gonna push for it. And, and we check ourselves out from, from those things. So, so these are some of the issues that come behind perceived identity. Um, I wanna highlight another one and, and it's important for this group is this idea of, are you a minority or are you diverse? And, and I'm not a minority, I'm not diverse, I'm not underrepresented, 
None of those things apply to me. As a matter of fact, I grew up in Puerto Rico being a majority. I grew up in a society where 99% of us were like me. Different colors, yeah, different genders, but we were all Puerto Ricans. We were not a minority. Uh, we were not discriminated against each other. It might be discrimination because of race and gender, but not as my racial and ethnic identity. Um, but the moment I stepped into the US, I became a minority overnight. So the minority is a tag that doesn't go with me, it goes with me as part of my affiliation to a group. So I am a member of a group that is underrepresented in computing. I am a minority in the United States or a member of a group that is a minority in the United States. Um, and when I walk into most social groups in North Carolina where I live, the groups becomes more diverse because there aren't many people like me in the social circles that I hang around with. Um, but the important thing is that this tag of minority or diverse or underrepresented is a tag that defines the relationship with the group, not me as a person. So I, in particular groups, I'm not underrepresented. There's some, I'm, I'm a member of the Hispanic caucus and I'm, we're all Hispanic. You know, there's maybe one or two that is not, but you know, we're not a minority in our campus we are, but not in the group. So, so it's, it's this issue that, that sometimes people use language and I'm sure Lisa will talk about this at the end how language sort of impacts how we look at people, right? And if you look at me as a minority, you start thinking that I'm minority, smaller, less than others. Um, <clears throat> so, so another part of the perceived identity is this phrase that you hear back and you hear it often as a pushback to diversity, we value everybody the same, or we don't see color, or we treat everybody the same, or if we treat a group differently, it's not fair to the others. And, and we wanna celebrate what we have in common rather than our differences. And the challenge with that is, and I don't have to tell this group this, you guys know this, is that the commonality in groups is weighted very, very, very heavily in favor of particular groups because of the history of the United States. And that means that I have to check at the door a lot of things about my identity because that's not in common in the group that I'm hanging around with. So, so when we talk about celebrating what we have in common, we talk about celebrating things that are part of the majority group and a few things that are mine, a few. As long as I conform to the majority group, we're gonna celebrate those things too. Um, and that becomes part of the issue of making me part of an outsider or students that are from minoritized groups as outsiders, because a lot of the things that are unique about them it's not in common because it's unique about them. So it doesn't get celebrated, it doesn't get bringed in. And then we're always forever pretending to be outsiders in larger groups. So the answer to that as we hear this is a nice cliche, be yourself, be your, bring your full self, self to work. Do you know what being myself means? Means that I don't have to hear language jokes. I don't have to hear jokes about how I mispronounce a word. I don't have to hear, anybody's surprised when I don't remember a particular word in English that everybody knows what it is, but I didn't because I didn't grow up with it. Or, or cultural jokes or cultural values. I, I grew up in Puerto Rico listening to TV in the days when there was no cable TV. So all the TV in the 60s, I did not see it in the 60s. I saw it in the 70s translated to Spanish and a lot of stuff didn't translate or didn't, wasn't used. So I, I went to college and I had a professor, his first name was Milton. And everybody called Uncle Milty and everybody laughed. And I thought that must be funny for some reason. I had no idea who Uncle Milty was in popular culture in the US. And I had no idea that that was sort of an insult to the guy. I, I had no clue, no clue. So I sort of, <laughs> that's funny Uncle Milty and I had no clue what they were talking about. So I could not be myself if the group is, you know, behaving. Trying to unmute myself. Okay. Um, so no qualitative judgments of things that are different across culture, food, music, customs, traditions, the fact that I have two last names, I'm tired of hearing. Which one is your last name? Both. Um, norms, clothing, you know, we, women wearing big earring loops, it's not a big deal in African-American and Latino circles, but there's always a comment about 
Alexandria Casio Ortez and her big earrings. Like, who, who cares? Let her wear her big earrings. Who cares? If you don't like him, don't like him. Um, and definitions of success. I mean, I, I've had, when I took the job at UNCC, I had a couple of colleagues, well-intended colleagues, that said things like, well, I sort of imagined you being department chair at New Mexico State. I'm like, I've never been to New Mexico. Why will I be department chair in New Mexico? Oh, there are a lot of Hispanics over there, but they're not my kind of Hispanics. There are very few Puerto Ricans in New Mexico. Why, why would you pigeonhole me in that corner, right? I mean, it, it, that, that defines a version of success that is not the one I was pursuing. I wasn't planning on moving to the west part of the U.S. I've never lived that far out west. My family lives east of here in Puerto Rico. So I'd rather go south, so closer to Puerto Rico than west. Uh, and But it's it's a definition of success that didn't match with the way I am or my aspirations. And and it, it, it blocks me from being myself and work. People are like, you want to do what? Why? And representation matters. I, this picture, I love this story. I love this picture. I was looking for it to put the picture on the presentation. And I found this really cool article on the New York Times that explained how this came about. The, the family, the dad was retiring from public service and the tradition is they go have a picture with the president. And each of the kids had a question. And the little one basically said, I wanna know if my hair is just like yours. And they didn't know what the question was. Everybody was surprised the picture as, as iconic as it is, it's a crappy picture. They cut the head off of the family. I mean, you, but it was just so weird and out of nowhere. And the president just bowed down and said, touch it. And apparently the kid was hesitant to touch it. Go ahead and touch it, dude. And then he touched it. It's like, yeah, it's like mine. This is the key of why representation matters, right? That kid sees this as somebody up there has the same hair as I do. And it's the leader of the free world. And I could probably do that too. Doesn't matter if he wants to be a president someday. It just means that it's possible, and that's the point of representation. And it's at the heart of identity. I want to see people in positions of power that look like me. I want to see people in positions of power that could represent my same interests. That I can go and approach him about something like same hair as mine or whatever. It, it might be insignificant, but it's important for the issue of representation and growth and identity. So. Um, so, okay, so what, what, who cares? Why does all this matters, right? Uh, wh what does this mean for mentoring of students? And, and more importantly, what can we do? Um, so students from minoritized groups, students from marginalized groups face additional challenges in their path to success. Um, they face structural challenges, there's few like them. They say social barriers, they have different cultural views and experiences and biases. Um, they often have a lack of family support, not because the family doesn't care, but because maybe they're first generation and you, know, you can't talk to mom and dad about how do I do something on campus when they've never lived on a campus or they probably find, have financial challenges. A lot of them are typically part-time employed and, and have, a job on the side, which normally we think that's great, but it also means it's less time to study. So it's just a challenge, even though financially it might be rewarding to them. They have a lack of role models. They don't see TAs that look like them. They don't see family, uh, faculty that look like them. They don't even see other students of color uh, that look like them. Uh, and obviously financial concerns. So to sort of get at this, I've been interviewing um, women of color in STEM majors uh, uh, here on campus. I started interviewing women of color computer science majors that were seniors and that group becomes small very quickly. So in the last semester, I expanded it to women of color in STEM majors. Uh, we've interviewed around 10 to 15 um, every semester. We've done it for two semesters. Uh, and basically we've been asking them questions. What challenges have you faced and, and have you consider changing majors and what kept you in your major or did you change your major? Just to sort of get a sense of their point of view of how their identity, in this case, women of color, uh, gets in the way of success. So I'm gonna give you some quotes and some examples here. Um, so, so this one, 
um, what challenges have you faced? Um, it's um, okay. So socially, I would say I'm probably one of three black females in my major. So sometimes if the other two girls aren't in my class, I just felt like I need help with stuff. It's harder to go to the guys and like asking them because they're very, they seem very secluded from us. They kind of don't want to talk or communicate with me, which can be frustrating. Again, their identity isolates them. Women of color, there are only three in the major. Um, and, and there's an extra block or challenge to talking to the other people in the classroom. Um, another student, this is literally the first semester when I've had another woman of color in one of my classes. Uh, so a lot of, we do a lot of pair programming. Uh, we're always in groups or in partnerships. And it's literally like, of course, the majority are white males. And I'm always the only minority in that group until it places a, and places a lot of pressure on me. And I'm like, I can't be the dumb one of the group. I got to show that I'm a smart woman. I'm a smart black woman. So that was one of the challenges that I faced. I just kind of went off of just being who I am. Just go for it. And again, the, 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 uh, the added challenge that this student face is that she wants to make sure she shows as smart and as prepared as others. It's not that I need to learn the material and get a good grade. No, I got to demonstrate on behalf of everybody else I'm representing that I'm smarter than anybody else. And that just adds more pressure to the effort of learning materials. Another one, within my 3000 level CS class right now, we have one TA that kind of just, uh, I didn't understand on the audio what they said. It makes it seem like, yeah, you guys can't do it. Like I'm in a group with all females and he, every time we ask the question, he's like, are you sure you want to do that? And I'm like, yeah, I know. Little, little questions. Yeah, I, I'm like, I don't need this. Again, the TA, the person that's supposed to help him because the group is all women, is basically discounting them and saying, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. That, that shouldn't be the way you're doing it. And it's just frustrating and discouraging to the student that is trying to move forward. Um, so we need to close the gap. We need to provide that extra support. We assume that we have TAs, we assume that we have professors and this and the other, but the reality is that the clash between the perceived identity and the self-identifying attributes of the student uh, presents an extra challenge. And, and it's our job to address that. Um, each student is different. Uh, I, I, I find these interviews fascinating because there's a section asking them about their family. And it's just, I would have never, never, never imagined the richness and backgrounds that these students have. And, and there aren't that many. You, you have to do it through interviews. You have to use qualitative methods that social scientists have used for decades uh, because doing this in a survey, it doesn't quite cut it. So. Let me show you some a couple more examples. Um, do you feel like you have to coach switch? And I was surprised that the black female students in our college, in our campus, because this includes a lot of engineering students too, um, know the term code switch. That was fantastic. Yes, 100%, like the stereotype threat is at an all time high bar. I just kind of feel as if I'm the only black girl in the class. So what I do when I say how I behave is how they've been perceived all black girls. So I find myself speaking the way they speak or anything of that nature, just so that I'm not the oddball. So again, forget about being bringing yourself to work. You actually have to behave like the rest so that people sort of have a sense of who you are and what you bring, but only in a way that is filtered and understood by them. Um, another one, Yes, yeah, so my freshman year, I actually wanted to change my major. I was going to change it to business just because I felt I didn't fit in the major. And it was a little hard, but after like being able to talk to some older, what uh, upperclassmen, black female engineers that motivated me and let me know that it doesn't really matter where you start as long as you just have the dedication to move on. That's all that really matters. Uh, this was a, an engineering major, was struggling in a class and, eventually talked to upper class female engineers and they said it doesn't matter that some people came from a fancy high school and they know some stuff that you don't it will even out down the road just keep that you know just keep doing it you'll succeed um again the, the, the support here is coming from peers that they find sometimes by coincidence um this one is a long story i'm gonna skip ahead and tell you just the gist of it this person was scared because everybody knew what programming was and she didn't she dropped the major, she changed, um, went to the advisor, changed the major, 
to, I think, business management information systems. And after a semester, realized she had made a mistake and went back to the advice and said, no, no, I went back. I went back. I want to go back to computer science. That's what I wanted to do. And the experience uh, let her understand that she made that mistake, that changed major, because she felt like she was lesser than everybody else in the class because the fact that she was a woman. And she switched, and she's two or three years ahead on the major and succeeding. And I mean, it, this is crazy that that clash between you not fitting in, that clash of identity, um, will even take you to change majors for a semester and then change back. Talk about obstacles in your road to success. Um, so we need to expand the social connection that the students face, that, that isolation that they have. Um, it's really making them change majors. It's not like they can't cut it. It's not like they're not smart. It's, it's blocking them because they don't see role models. Um, we need to provide role models. We need to send students to conferences so that they see other professionals that look like them. We need to create student groups along their identity lines. I've got some slides on that I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, diversify your TAs, particularly your intro courses. Hire some of your juniors and seniors, students from marginalized group to be TAs to the other ones. I mean, a lot of these students have mentioned that they meet a senior who's a black woman and that made all the difference to make them realize yeah, it's a little rocky, but you'll survive. Um, increase the visibility of the few that you have in your staff so that students see themselves and others in your discipline, faculty and staff. There aren't many of us, but if you increase their visibility, it invites uh, the students to reach out to people that look like them. I had a couple of participants in the interviews who routinely went to an advisor in university college, not in our college, because it was a black woman that talked to them at one point and became sort of like the unofficial mentor because they didn't have enough in our college to sort of help them on, on that or in engineering. It, it, sometimes we, we've had a lot of engineering students in, in the interviews. Um, so the, the student orgs as a support uh, structure has been amazing in the interviews. Uh, I've, a lot of the black female students have mentioned Nesby. One of them mentioned that she knew about Nesby from high school. Uh, before she came to campus, and this was an engineering student, she knew what Nesby was and she knew she had to join Nesby because friends had told her, said, you got to join Nesby. And Nesby is the National Society for Black Engineers. Um, they have computer science students as part of Nesby. Here's some examples of some of the things uh, students said. Um, we asked them what kept you in the major after considering changing majors. Uh, Nesby had a lot to do with it, the National Society of Black Engineers, just being able to be around other Black people and talking to them and realizing that not everyone, that all, we're all kind of struggling in a way. Another one say, I would say Nesby plays a role in my major just because that's a community of Black engineers. They include computer scientists, so that's really good too. And it's just really easy for us to be a family, be able to talk about these things that are going on within computer science and stuff like that. Um, so. Identity matters. Um, the students from marginalized groups uh, face um, more challenges. They have fewer opportunities. Uh, they have fewer role models. And to close the gap, we need to find a way to provide those extra services. And that doesn't mean we're favoring them. That doesn't mean we're watering the degree. That doesn't mean we're giving away grades. It means they face additional challenges that if we choose to ignore them, we continue leaving them on the marginalized lane and not being able to provide the opportunities for them to succeed. Um, expand the visibilities of groups within student orgs or invited speakers or diversifying your TA pool so that they can be themselves. For them to bring themselves to work or to their classes, they need to see others like them, right? Um, provide networking opportunities uh, by reaching out to other groups across colleges, across campus, um, and shift the conversation towards more asset mentality rather than deficient mentality. Just because they're different, that doesn't mean they're less. That doesn't mean they're less prepared. They just have a different preparation. They have other successes and opportunities and strength that if we don't bring into the commonality of the group, then, then we're missing out. We're missing out by not having them in our group. So... Yeah, Going to stop right there and open it up for questions. Um, thank you for inviting me.
then I'll pass it on to Yvette. Um, Walt, I see your hand up. <laughs> yeah, this, this resonates for a couple of reasons. One of which, as you may have heard here at NC State, there's a plan afoot to massively increase the size of our engineering undergraduate program. And at a couple of contexts, I've raised the question of, well, isn't this an opportunity to increase the diversity of our engineering program? And I ha haven't gotten much of a response on that yet. So I guess my question is, uh, and maybe, you know, I would start agitating to, to bring you to our campus in some sort of formal way, and if that were possible, on this very issue. But if you were, if you had the ear of uh, our chancellor, let's say, and our provost who are big, big, you know, thousands more engineering students, and this is an opportunity, what would you tell them? What would be, what would be the, uh, you know, the elevator speech of what they should be doing to use this opportunity to diversify engineering at NC State. So, so uh, that, that's a great opportunity and great question. I, I'm, I'm going to assume that your provost and your chancellor or president are, would be persuaded by facts and science and research. You know, it's a safe assumption, although maybe, maybe not. But uh, so, I mean, it, there's a lot of evidence that says that groups are more productive, that classrooms are engaging in more discussions, the more diversity you bring into the classroom. So I think, I think your school engineering would be better by having a more diverse group of students. I mean, it, you know, what, what greater opportunity than you say, we're gonna bring a thousand more students and the distribution of those students should mirror the state or mirror the East Board region. And, say, well, that means what, 35% Blacks and 20% Latinos, and, and, and that's a reasonable goal, right? I mean, you're serving the state, you're serving the region, so you might as well bring in a population that mirrors that, and you might as well bring in a population that will make your classroom better by having more diversity in the classroom, more points of view, more ideas, more uh, um, opportunities to explore problems that haven't been explored. Um, so that that's the way I would sell it. I very rarely that works with people, unfortunately. Um, I mean, the, the sort of the sky is falling point of view would be, and this is another pitch. It's like just look at what we're doing today. Look at the issue with facial recognition that doesn't recognize black faces at the same rate as white. Why do you think that is? Oh, a lot of the researchers are white. You need to have more people of color in building the technology of the future so that the technology is inclusive for all of us. I mean, uh, the, and, and this applies to all the engineering fields. It's not just computing or, or electrical engineering. Civil engineers have approved highways that cut through neighborhoods and segregate a city in ways that shouldn't have been. You know, I, I bet you anything that if those civil engineers included more black engineers or were more culturally educated, that would not have been a decision they made. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of reasons why we need more diversity. Hopefully any of those would help and I'll be happy to come and yell at them. <laughs> thank you. Um, Joel, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Wonderful presentation. I resonated with it completely. So one of the challenges, and I understand about, you know, trying to be out there to offer the opportunity that the students and others can achieve what you have achieved, what we have achieved. So how, how do you try to help faculty, students balance this need to share your craft, to excite the next generation, but at the same time also try to achieve those things that makes you know the profession better. Um, I, I I I count my lucky stars. I I really don't have a good answer. I mean, I I started my career um, at the University of Puerto Rico, um, and you know, minority institution in Puerto Rico. We're not ever we're going to compete with the top schools in the U.S but it was a really good engineering school. So I had a lot of really good opportunities to work with students and, and do a lot of cool things. But I eventually realized I, I, 
I have a ceiling here. I can't, you know, do the things that I want to do. I was a computer science professor in engineering. I was the only computer science professor in engineering. I wasn't an engineer. And that put me in a different salary scale that people sort of treated me like a service professor. I got to teach every software class because nobody else could. And eventually I thought, ah, you know, this isn't for me. It's my home. It's my community. It's my identity. But I not professionally wasn't. So I... I had to sort of bounce around and find pockets. And then I went to Virginia Tech where professionally I felt very happy, but then it was the opposite. It was like six Latino professors in arts and sciences where I got there and the other one was my wife. So two of us were 30% of the Latino professors in the College of Arts and Sciences. That's scary. Uh, two of the other six were professors of Spanish with my wife in her department. It's like, really, is that it? That I mean, so I was completely an outsider. Um, I, you know, and I've been lucky that I've kept both things, like the professional contribution to my disciplines, writing papers, writing grants, doing research, but at the same time, speaking up and being part of groups that were going, oh, no, this isn't the way you should do it. I don't know that I had a good balance. I did a lot of stuff before I was full professor that I probably shouldn't have. I did a lot of stuff before I was tenured that I probably shouldn't have. But again, I got lucky. I had enough publications that people said, that's a decent contribution. Wait, what's he doing with all this other stuff? He could have published more, but they didn't block me because of that. So I, 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 don't, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I made full professor by moving to Charlotte, uh, which I don't have a problem with it, but some people think that's less of a thing. I don't know that I was eventually going to make full professor at Virginia Tech because they didn't value all this diversity stuff that I have been doing. Their loss. Uh, I you just sort of at some point got to move forward. The reality is in academia is that you got to keep up the, the sort of the definition, the standard definition of success. Otherwise, they kick you out in no time, particularly if you're a minority, if you're black or woman or a woman of color, forget it, it's even faster. So, so you have to sort of keep a balance of saying, I got to keep doing this thing so that I don't get kicked out. But at the same time, I got to provide enough support for others to go like, we're, we're here and we belong. I, I know there's only one, but we, we, we do. Uh, and and I, 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 I wish I'd give you a simple answer. I got lucky. I really got lucky. I found good mentors, found people that saying, you're doing a little too much on that side, do a little bit on this one, and kept the balance. And, and uh, I'm, I'm still here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Daniel? Thanks. I also um, appreciated very much the, the the presentation, and of course, I'd be delighted to have Manuel come to our campus also. But I did want to assure Walt that this is definitely on our radar screen. Um, in fact, I, I had a, a conversation with with our dean last evening um, uh, about this this very topic. Uh, our our dean is from Puerto Rico, and so he understands, uh, you know, and um, that's that's not to that's not to to uh, predict in any way how successful we'll be because I understand the challenges. Be, I'm in electrical computer engineering, which is it probably as big a challenge, if not more, uh, than computer science in terms of diversity. So, but I did uh, I did want to let uh, Walt know that this is a, a very active topic of communication of uh, conversation in engineering. And the, the, the big challenge is that we just have to change how we do things, right? I mean, I think a lot of people say, well, I want more of X. And it's like, and what are you doing differently to get more of X? So, uh, we are announcing the positions. They just don't apply. That's not enough. Because, I mean, it, um, a lot of us don't see ourselves represented in other communities. When, when I interviewed at UNC Charlotte, one of the things that I walked away from my in-person interview that that convinced me that I wanted to come here was how many black and Latino administrators are positioning high up uh, in, in academia I found on campus. It was like at Virginia Tech, I was the highest ranking, God, minority. I think everybody was male and white above me at, at Virginia Tech when I was in the grad school. Even the other associate deans and the dean of the grad school were women. But outside of that, they were all white men. And uh, I came here, I met a couple of black and I met Yvette and I met, it's like, wow, this is kind of cool. It's not like we're just a bunch of professors at the low level. We have administrators that at least speak my language, understand concerns, 
were happy that uh, Hispanic was interested in having an administrative position on campus. And I was welcoming to it in ways that I don't know others would have. And But sometimes we I, there are a lot of people on campus that equate equality with equity and don't understand the difference. And to me, that's a challenge. I've had groups uh, at Virginia Tech, we, we the Hispanic Caucus of Virginia Tech told departments, we'll be willing to meet with your candidates if they're Hispanic and they want to chat with us. We'll happy to go take them to lunch in the interview process. And we've had departments that said, well, that's not fair because what are we going to do with the white candidates? Going, I don't know, creative white caucus. I, I mean, that sounds scary. I don't want a white caucus on campus. But I mean, I, I, how is that a disadvantage? You're going to hire a white person by default anyway. So I'm just evening the odds, but they don't understand that evening the odds means equity and they don't see it as equality. So they rather do nothing and that becomes a challenge. If you change nothing, you're gonna continue getting the same patterns and results that you've had for the last hundred years. You gotta, sh you gotta shift the practices so that you get a different result. So that's, that's a challenge. It's hard to sell that to people. Madhu? Hi, uh, this was really great to hear. So thank you for this. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. So my question is, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, especially in the context of this, this pandemic circumstance we are in, where we are approaching the start of the third year. And it's a pandemic that has sharpened the contrast between uh, all the impacts, especially for minority communities. We have a lot of, you know, what the students we have from those backgrounds on campus are, have particular struggles. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or suggestions on, on addressing these inequity and inclusion issues in the context of this crisis right now. Um, I, I will mention one thing. Last, um, last summer, two summers ago, I guess, when the protest, the social protest uh, erupted, I started thinking, I get invited to give a lot of talks. I mean, you know, there, there aren't that many of us in computing at, at the full professor level. So it's like, let's invite Manuel and Juan Gilbert and this other guy to give all this panel. So, and in, in the conversations, I always kept going out thinking, well, how can I make my situation for my students better? What What's what's the more equitable thing I can do? And the, you feel helpless because I mean I, I'm I'm teaching a class in a computer science major. I'm not I don't control fellowships or scholarships or anything like that, right? But one thing kept resonating, and it was the idea that um, a lot of people were unemployed, a lot of people were having challenges because of work, and then COVID started, you know, blowing up and all these things. And I kept thinking, well, how how does that relate to my classroom? And it always ended up. Uh, grading, you know, how do I grade students? And I started looking at equity in grading. I thought, no, that'd be a good Google search. And lo and behold, there's a book called Equity in Grading and a whole bunch of research. And I completely, completely changed how I do grading in my class. I threw it out the window. I said, that doesn't work for a thousand reasons and even more so now. And it, and it was a challenge to make the change, but the, the criticality of the moment was like, if I'm ever going to change how I grade in my classes, now is the reason, now is the moment that nobody's going to say, you're being arbitrary. And no, look at what's happening out there. So so I, I completely, I changed how I do grading. I could probably speak an hour about that. Uh, uh, got a panel coming up at a conference on that. And to me, that was one thing that I did that, that recognizes that students have demands outside of work at a level much higher than when I was a student, right? I, when I was a student, I keep hearing from people that say, oh, I worked as a waitress at a restaurant and I paid tuition with that. Go like, yeah, no, that doesn't pay tuition today. No, no, nowhere that pays tuition. That barely pays rent, if at all. So people have three jobs. And now you have three jobs, you don't have time to do homeworks. And in computing, we have a lot of off classes, of classroom projects that People expect them to spend 20 hours. And I thought, God, this is a time not to have 20 hours of research projects or programming projects outside of class because half my students have two, three jobs or they're taking care of their kid or their mom have COVID and they're taking care of their, you know. 
So, so I totally changed how I did that, and I'm, I'm still tweaking it. I don't think I have the right answer. Uh, but that, that was one thing that, that it dawned on me that society had changed enough that the demand of outside of the classroom is different. For us at UNCC, a ton of our students work um, outside. So we're not a residential college. I, I, I did my undergrad and my master's in, in Ball State in Indiana, tiny university in the middle of nowhere. You went there and you stayed there all the time. Um, that's not the case here. Our students work and, and do other things outside. And we need to adjust the demand for what we say is this is enough for you to demonstrate to me that you succeeded or you've learned something that doesn't expect them to be bored on Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, I, I posted in a listserv a discussion about if you extend a deadline to Sunday and you feel good because you gave students more time, I have surprise news for you. If they're working, that's when they work eight hours at the shoe store or at the whatever. So you just gave an advantage to the student that doesn't need to work. You're thinking you're being fair and equitable, and you're increasing the gap between the ones that my dad has enough money, I don't have to work, and the one that I have to work at the shoe store on Saturday so I could pay the bills and eat. And so, so I think I think a lot of our notions of of grading and progress and success uh, need to be different. I, I'm still, like I said, I'm still tweaking. I don't think I'm there yet, but I'm starting to see a lot of details. And there's a lot of literature on this. I'm, I'm still reading some books and stuff. So that, that would be my answer, but that comes from a professor in the classroom, not from you know, uh, a department chair or, or dean of students or something like that. So that, that each one of those levels would have different things to do to contribute to the conversation. And the challenge is that, that there's a lot of pushback and there's a lot of pushback because we're not being fair or we're not being equal or we're not being, so it's, you have to sort of do it in a, in a sort of careful language and way so that you don't get derailed. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to share that I, I've also gone down the same path with my classes. I've implemented labor-based grading, which worked really well in this last semester, but I'm also looking into ungrading, which is something I see people doing as well. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. You know, Manuel, if I can ask you a question, you know, we are talking a lot about um, how we can change policies within departments to value the kinds of things that you did, right, that you said didn't get you much traction, but you were able to do the other stuff things, right? So the DEI work that you did. And I'm not trying to suggest that as academics, we shouldn't be doing research, but how do we value, um, you know, some of that may not be the stuff that I publish in, you know, a paper about a bench research project in my area, right? But in fact, it's about we work in DEI with students or with faculty or whatever within my department. Um, and how do we value that? How do we get departments to look at that, not simply by checking the box that says I have something in my syllabus, but actually values work that individuals do? How do you see that sort of fitting into our policies and procedures? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So. Um... I'll give you three levels of answers. The first one is counting it. I mean, it, it doesn't get counted, right? I mean, a lot of the service work that uh, faculty for minoritized group or, or um, marginalized groups do usually doesn't count. Um, and and it doesn't count because it's not of the traditional, you know, service committee, right? Uh, um, it doesn't count because sometimes we do it because we like to do it. Sometimes we do it because we need to do it and find camaraderie with other groups. But it's not something that, that gets assigned to you. Um, and it also doesn't get counted because oftentimes you get pulled into doing things. I've been called and I've, tell this, I've told this story before. I had a sabbatical a few years back and we had professors from Jamaica that were coming to campus and they called me from my sabbatical so I could meet with them. It was like, what do I have in common with professors from Jamaica? We're both from the Caribbean. That's, that's, I mean, if it was Cuba, I can say, yeah, we get more things. Jamaica, no. But that was the closest thing to a Jamaican that the department had. And, and 
that doesn't count. That it, it takes hours to do these things because there aren't enough people to represent all the different interests. We end, end up representing more interests and it doesn't get counted. So the very, very lowest, simplest level is let's really count all these things. Let's count these things so that you have a more fair distribution. And, and maybe that means that I do only diversity work on service committee and not in curriculum committees. But I mean, I, I, I as, as bad as sort of segregation that feels, it would be a more reasonable workload because then I wouldn't be in five committees and the diversity stuff, right? So that's one. Um, then comes the research. I mean, I think a lot of, um, I think we have very, 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 very um, conservative notions of research and scholarship. I think um, unless you're doing deep research in diversity, um, a lot of times you're doing things that are opinion pieces or, or, or challenging notions of what's fair and what's not. And that doesn't count as peer review, even if it is peer review, it doesn't count as a traditional research paper. And so it, it's hours of work that again, doesn't get counted. And um, often what I hear in computing rooms, uh, uh, not necessarily my college, but computing departments is the idea of, well, they shouldn't be, they should be doing that in the social justice department or in sociology or in education, that's not computing research. So I think that has to come from the top. That has to come from the professional organizations, ACM and others like that saying, this is stuff that we need to be part of it. We shouldn't be farming this off to people in social justice. We should be doing it with them, not just them. We should be partnering in solving this issue and publishing research that addresses some of these issues with our point of view expressed in there. Um, so that, that's another one. And the last one I think is we need to start I mean, I, I've always looked at service teaching and research as dials, and I think we should just adjust them for each professor. I mean, I, I, this notion that, that we all should be editors of a journal by the time you go off for tenure, it's insane because that, that assumes that I, I've never been on an editorial board. That's not true. I wasn't one for a couple of years. I, I don't get invited to those things, and I've got publications. I've got a decent H index. I've got a lot of research grants. But when, when people sort of say, oh, who can be the editor of this journal? My name doesn't come up because of the same issues that we face. So, so I don't have the same chances to succeed in the traditional way that others succeed. And that means I'm a disadvantage, I guess. I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think of myself a disadvantage, but it's a different sort of set of ladders and steps that you're going up in your career. I mean, I, I mean the, the best example of this is that I moved to UNCC I got all those awards that you mentioned after I moved here for work that I had done before. And it's like, Virginia Tech, sorry, you lost it. I'm gonna get recognized as UNCC because they valued what I brought in and they hired me. And then the awards that typically come after the fact then came under another umbrella uh, and it was their loss, uh, and, you know. But again, nobody recognized that contribution at the time when it was my promotion over there. So. I think we need to. I think we need to be more flexible on what we measure, what we count as success, and we need to be more careful in counting uh, all those, you know, surveys that are non-traditional that all of us get pulled into because we're women, we we're black, you're Latino, you're whatever. Thank you, Jamila. I hope I said that right. Well, that was perfect. Oh, but. <laughs> Uh, honestly, it's, uh, th thank you for saying that correctly, Yvette. Um, so uh, uh, to your to your point about the research, I, I honestly think we lose a lot of brilliant students from underrepresented groups because um, for some reason, STEM has this idea that it, if you have any social justice work that's a part of it, that that, that does not belong in STEM. And um, you know, I have an undergraduate degree in meteorology, but a PhD in science education, specifically because through education, I could look at uh, cultural dynamics as to why uh, people are engaged in science, how they teach science. And I didn't see a lens for that in meteorology. It was like, no, that's separate. Um, and I think we lose a lot of brilliant uh, re potential researchers mm -hmm. uh, from communities uh, of, of color and other marginalized groups because of that very narrow lens that we have of what does science research count as. 
Absolutely. I, I, I had an undergrad student at the University of Puerto Rico, I, I still follow her on, on Facebook, um, who came up to talk to me. She had a couple of classes for me, computer engineering, female, one of a few, was doing fantastic and said, I, I want to do grad school. I said, well, that's great. What do you want to do? I want to teach. I said, you want to teach? Why don't you do a PhD in education? And she just looked at me like, what? I'm a computer engineer. I said, you want to teach, right? She said, yeah. We'll learn how to teach. And she did. She went and got a PhD in education instead of engineering. And it's doing fine. I had a fantastic career. And she reached out to me, I don't know, 10 years later, said, you don't know what you did. I'm like, what did I do? So you told me to consider a PhD in education. I'm like, okay. She said, I changed all my plans because of that. And I couldn't be happier. I, I, I had no clue, but I mean, she wanted to teach. I said, consider education. You don't have to have three degrees in the same thing uh, and, and work in an R1 to be successful, to, to you know say, well, that's the path everybody follows. No, not for you. That's not the path that you need to follow. You need to follow a path that connects with your passion. So your example is fantastic. You know, you, you've got the science and you've got the education and that's what you wanted to do. Go for it. And, and you know, just, just got to find your path and move forward. I mean, I, that, that goes back to my comment of people expecting me to be chair of New Mexico State or something like that. I mean, like, no, that's not... I mean, that sounds like the next step for me, but it's not. I don't want to move to New Mexico. Nothing against New Mexico. I'm sure it's beautiful out there. But I have no interest in going there. I'd much rather stay here in North Carolina, honestly, uh, even though I've only lived here six years. Uh, um, so, I mean, I, I, think, I think we each need to explore what that means, and we each need to question what does it mean for me to be successful and what is what are others saying I need to do to be successful and sort of push back a little bit. So I, I really want to do this. Can I just do this and and let me you know, we'll call that good and success and be happy. Thank you. Marsha. Yeah, thanks. Um, going back to the discussion about um, increasing diversity in engineering or in the student population in general. Um, I'm serving on our department's uh, graduate admissions committee right now. And um, uh, we, so we have had a couple of students who to me look like they, they really struggled in high school and early in college, um, had to work three jobs, um, one of them dropped out of high school. Then they, they went to um, various undergraduate institutions. And then at some point, things just turn around and they started getting all, all A's in all of their important math classes and everything. Went on, they're currently working on master's degree. Um, but our admissions committee didn't, weren't able to see this. And, um, and I tried to um, persuade them that these students were really a good, um, th that they showed so much determination and, and ability that they would be able to do fine in our program, but they were still just really afraid that the students would not be able to handle our courses. Um, so do you have any, any suggestions about that kind of situation? Well, I mean, the, the long-term suggestion is you need more people in your department that have had that kind of background so that not everybody looks like they went to an R1 for undergrad and an R1 for grad school and, and their life was all perfect and beautiful and well-planned. Um, I, I, I'm one of those cases. I, I did my undergrad and left. I, you know, two years and worked and, and, and I actually went back to grad school because I sort of started teaching because somebody had left the university in Puerto Rico, one of the two year colleges, and they were desperate. We need somebody tomorrow. Can you do it? I said, sure. I mean, I, I was 21 years old that just had a bachelor's degree and I was teaching a college level course and I loved it. And then the thing that sort of worked for me or, or motivated me was a lot of the other people teaching, this is back in the early 80s did not have computing degrees. So I was way more prepared than PhDs in business and sciences because they didn't know anything about computing. They were learning it. 
as they went. I had a bachelor. So I, and they kept asking me questions. I'm going like, why am I answering questions to all the people that have a full-time job? And I had to wait till the week before classes start to know if I could teach or not. I, at one point I was teaching at five universities. So if you look at that background of mine, you wouldn't think twice to hire me as a tenure track professor because I taught in private for-profit universities. I taught in community colleges part-time for two years. But at that, that made me think, well, I want to do research. And then when I went to my PhD, it took me nine years to get my PhD. The same thing, I didn't have money, so I had to work full time. And, and it wasn't until I got the job at the Naval Research Lab where I was doing research that my PhD and my research, my work were the same thing. And that's when I sort of was able to finish. That's nothing like a successful career. Um, and I honestly tell you that I don't think Virginia Tech would have hired me had I not gone to UPR first and won a career award. And then they were like, ah, we want you, come over here, right? So it, you need more people that looks at those sort of non-straight path and go like, that's fine. I mean, it, you know, only privileged people go to the top R1 and R1 and, and, and get a PhD and, you know, by the time they're 28. I was 38 when I was hired at Virginia Tech. So, uh, and, you know, the, the, the advantage of that, and I think Virginia Tech saw this, the advantage is I was way more mature than the other three people that were hired that got the PhD the semester before. I had more experiences. I knew how university worked. I got into interesting, difficult conversations that people were like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that. I was going like, that's wrong. I'm going to say it because I was a little bit more mature and I understood if you're going to fire me for that, I'll go get another job. I don't, you know, I, I, I've been through this. I've had multiple jobs. I've worked in different places. I did software development. I worked as a researcher in government. I can get a job. So fire me if you want to, but I'm going to say what I have to say. That's a value that you have to be able to look at it and say, we want people like that. So I think one of the things that people say about students like the one you describe is resiliency. These are people that are really have the background to stick it out and succeed. And if you just got straight A's from middle school to you got your PhD, you're going to freak out when you get a B or you're going to freak out when your first proposal gets rejected from NSF. And you don't need that. You want somebody that can be there and go like, yeah, give, give me more. I'm ready. Pitch. I'm going to hit her over the fence. And that comes from people that have faced some of those obstacles. I, I, I don't have a simple solution other than saying you need to diversify your faculty, which is you know, a, a bigger challenge than diversifying your grad students. Um, I think uh, some places are doing non-traditional ways of evaluating the candidates. I've heard a couple of places that have started looking at the first cut of, of resumes being done by another group that is blind to things like count the publications and you know things like that so that you get the first group without saying, oh, I know his advisor. Yeah, he will be good, uh, which lends to be more copies of what you already have in your department. Um, so I, it, I, I don't have a good answer, but I mean, I think we need to disrupt the system, basically. We need to say, yeah, we can't just take things and look at them and expect them to all be 27 years old, finishing the PhD within a year and hire them, because that's just going to bring more of the same people. Oh, thanks. So if no one else has a question, I'm going to take you know, the opportunity, because I get to introduce you and be the person moderating the session to ask this last question of you. And that is, it's sort of a follow up to what we what you've been talking about. And that is, you know, a lot of um, things that we've said about faculty and how we what we value within, within DEI um, doesn't always take into consideration the amount of work that that faculty of color do in the community and, and other people, right? And other, uh, other avenues to disseminate information to community groups, right? And so how, for instance, you have a TEDx, right? I don't know what your department thinks of that, but my guess is many departments would not think that was, you know, something that was of great value in terms of the kinds of dissemination of information that you may be doing. So I know that there are a lot of folks that have 
uh, you know, I have a Twitter account, although quite frankly, very seldom actually post anything. Um, but you know, that they might have a Twitter account or a blog or something like that. And how do we start making that as, you know, we are where we are, I think, as a society where people don't value science or think that somehow it's not something that we need to know because we tend to talk to each other in words that no one else understands. And those individuals that do something out in the community, whether it's to other academics or to um, community uh, uh, engagement beyond academics in these avenues, how do you see that um, as fitting into what we're talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, uh, my college loves that I did a tech talk, my dean is here, and she gave a tech talk the same year I did. So we, we've done our part of publishing it on the website and sending it to communications. It's also a UNCC TED Talk, so I think it's in UNCC's interest to sort of plug us. Um, but but surprisingly, these things you know get seen by people that probably would not have read my research papers, right? I, I'm, I'm giving a talk at Urbana-Champaign in a couple of weeks, specifically because somebody saw the TED Talk and said, we want you to come and talk about that to us. And, and I, I tweeted this recently, it's like, it's some kind of special when a university you apply for grad school rejected you, and then they invite you to come give a talk at their faculty meeting. You know, it's like, have I arrived? Some, I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting and it's weird, right? Uh, it makes me feel to start a talk saying, you know, remember 1982? You know, you guys weren't very nice to me, but I'll forgive you. Let me give you tell you all my work now. Uh, it's important. I mean, I, I think I think it opens doors. It opens visibility. It opens. Uh, uh, more opportunities to to expand your outreach of your work and 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 the things you do. Um, it, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it, how how do we count that? How does that how is how is that measured? Uh, I don't I don't know that we do the right thing other than putting it on the website and celebrate it. Uh, and and I don't I'm not complaining on my colleagues. Like I said, they posted my thing and on the website when it happened and all that. But but it doesn't, I mean, you know, I, I, we, we need to celebrate some of those things, particularly for those of us that are outside the tiny little box of just our disciplinary, uh, um, uh, you know, silos. Uh, I, I, I have always, I, maybe this is one of my faults, I have always been interested in many different things. Um, I, I, I do computer science education, I do HDI, I do diversity. I play with a lot of people at one point at Virginia Tech. One of my letters of, rec of evaluation actually said he needs to be less of a collaborator with people. And I had a colleague uh, who was at the same level as me that fought with a personnel company. He's like, what the hell are you saying? We fight for people to collaborate. You have a guy here that excels at collaboration and you're telling him not to play to his strength. So, so we clearly don't know how to measure people that don't follow the narrow, clean path that everybody follows, or not everybody, but you know, traditionally academia has followed. We need to count these things. I mean, it, uh, NSF wants us to disseminate our work. What better way than to be featured at a TEDx? I mean, you know, that should go a long way. That should count for something. Um, we, don't, we don't know. It, it's hard to, to count it because it's not, other than the administrators that value the outside face, the people a little lower, like faculty, they think of that as a waste of time. Well, but can you publish a journal paper? I can, but I'm going to do this instead. You know, um, and, and, and again, I don't recommend that for somebody that is on their second year of tenure, but I'm full professor. I mean, why, why not? Why not use that as a way to sort of expand the reach of my department, my institution, my college, my career. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with it, but it doesn't get counted for anything. I don't see anybody in, in any of my evaluations saying he was invited to talk at Urbana Champagne in the seminar series. Yeah, that's nice, but it, it doesn't count when you're measuring my productivity is still dollars and publications, even somebody at the level that I'm at. So I, I think we need to change the notion of, of you know, what we value in academia. We're, we're still, I mean, I used to enjoy the fact that academia changed slow. And I think society in the last 10 years had just gone shoom, and we were like, oh, wait, slow, slow down. I'm behind, I can't catch up now. I think we need to be more agile.
You're muted. Well, you didn't hear that whole long thing I just said, so sorry. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you for <laughs> this wonderful talk and your interaction with everybody. And I appreciate everyone else that was here and, and asked questions and has been listening so attentively. But thank you so much, Manuel. It was really wonderful. And I appreciate your accepting our, our invitation to speak today. Thank you. My pleasure.